The next video, uh, Dairoga video, is about normal labor and delivery. It consists of two parts. The first part deals with the first stage of labor and the second part with the second and third stage of labor. Um, here, the wanted outcome, uh, obviously a happy mother with a baby who is um, on her chest, skin to skin contact, and that's what we're aiming for, hopefully with minimal intervention. I still found it a very moving and impressive um, uh, visual picture, and it's um, a privilege to witness that on a regular basis. The overview of this lecture, firstly, um, first stage, we will focus on the first stage here, but I will first discuss the three different stages of labor, what signs and symptoms, uh, what is the definition of each stage, what do we mean by false labor, how do we find out if a pregnant woman has indeed a rupture of membranes, what is the usual duration of the first stage and how do we manage the first stage? I'll discuss the importance of continuous emotional support and what it requires from us as caregivers. Important as well, what pain management options do we have? And I'll finish with some conclusions. There's three stages. The first stage starts with the uh, onset of uterine contractions and finishes when the cervix is fully dilated or fully, as we call it in Australia. Second stage starts when the cervix is fully dilated and the mother starts pushing, um, working together with uterine contractions and it finishes when the baby is born. The third stage finishes when the placenta is born. The first stage of labor. The onset of labor is characterized by regular and painful uterine contractions, which eventually result in some cervical changes, and usually that means effacement and dilatation of the cervix. I'll explain that later. Regular means, in usual, at least three contractions in every 10 minutes. They should be painful, which is of course subjective, and it has to be um, discriminated from the so-called Braxton Hicks contractions or practice contractions. The pregnant woman will be aware of the contractions, might perceive, perceive them as somewhat painful, but they do not result in cervical changes. And that discriminates them from true labor. The cervical changes um, quite often that coincides with the mother-to-be telling us that she lost some mucus, sometimes blood-stained, a little bit red or brown blood-stained mucus, which means that shows that the cervical uh, plug is um, being um, discarded as a result of the cervical changes. So it's a clinical sign which points at cervical changes. Not sure if false labor contractions or explosive diarrhea. How do we discriminate on a more serious note between false and true labor? The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has given us this clear overview. False labor, often irregular contractions, they do not get closer together as time progresses. False labor, the contractions might stop when the mother-to-be walks or rests and may even stop with a change of position in contrast to true labor, where the contractions will continue. The strength of the contractions are usually weak and do not get much stronger over time compared to true labor. Pains of the contractions usually felt in the front and true labor more towards the back and moves then to the front. Again, subjective um, symptoms of the mother, the mother-to-be, which will have to be confirmed by a digital vaginal examination because after, for instance, a four-hour interval, we must be able to demonstrate cervical changes.
Then another important topic, the rupture of the membranes. Interesting, in uh, English we call it the water has broken or rupture of membranes, ROM. The woman will report uh, somewhat more wet vagina or some fluid noticeable on her perineum and typically intermittent leaking of small amounts of watery fluid from her vagina, especially when she walks or when she does a cough. Sometimes it presents like a real gush of clear or pale yellow fluid from the vagina and it's different from the white homogeneous uh, vaginal discharge which characterized term pregnancy. If rupture of membranes without contractions, that's control called PROM, P labor rupture of membranes. To make it even more complicated, if this occurs before the gestational age of 37 weeks, we define it as P-PROM, preterm pre labor rupture of membranes. No, I'm not yet done. We have SROM, which is spontaneous rupture of membranes, or ARM, artificial rupture of membranes. Well, um, what, you might be, be somewhat confused, but I'm really sorry. This is the jargon, this is the gibberish we use in obstetrics around the world, and it's probably good to familiarize yourself with that. I found the expression, the water is breaking, quite funny. In the Netherlands, we no, don't know that phenomenon, while this country is quite familiar with water management. This lady asks herself, how can I get my water to break? Well, there is no evidence-based uh, approach for this. And if you Google on YouTube, you see this lady apparently carrying a twin pregnancy. She is convinced, and she does that with convincingly and with a smile, that she uh, has a, a, a dance which uh, results in breaking of water. I don't think there is a, a control study here. Confirming the suspicion of rupture of membranes, important, do not do a digital vaginal examination, even if with the sterile glass, because you might bring the infection, the, the, the mixed germs from the vagina higher up into the cervix and the clock of infection starts ticking. So contraindicated. We use a sterile speculum examination when the lady is in the dorsal lithotomy position and we try to find out whether we can see some fluid leaking from the cervix into the speculum or into the fornix posterior. If so, we can take a little bit of fluid, uh, dry that on an object class for about 10 minutes and put it under the microscope. And we ask ourselves whether we can see the typical crystallization or ferning. By the way, um, a study from uh, the Netherlands showed that the sensitivity in labor and the specificity of this ferning test is quite good in contrast to pre-labor situation. Another test we can do is to uh, whether uh, we take a little bit of the fluid and measure the pH. If the pH is between 7 and 7.5, that confirms the suspicion of amniotic fluid. A normal vaginal pH is lower, is slightly acidic as you might know. By the way, after sexual intercourse, the, the pH test is not very reliable because the semen pH is also slightly alkaline. But anyway, if you do this carefully, and um, that is not a bad test at all and very affordable. The more recent, um, more expensive tests are a so-called immunoassay test. Uh, there are a few examples. Here, there is no speculum examination required. The lady can take a uh, high vaginal swab herself and uh, we test them here for a specific uh, placental alpha microglobulin 1, PAMG1. Uh, this test takes about 10 minutes, so same time as the ferning or uh, an even bit longer uh, when you would check the pH. Uh, a study uh, published in 2016, when we compare back-to-back -back the ferning test and the uh, immunoassay test, sensitivity of the immunoassay test is higher, specificity higher, positive predictive value a bit better. So in this test, um, where women were uh, found to have ruptured membranes, all these women, uh, the 
the more modern test is uh, test characteristics are superior. However, an interesting study um, uh, published in the Asian Pacific Journal of Reproduction compared back to back uh, an IGFB1 test, a Fernick test, and a pH test. And when you add all the test characteristics up, the total accuracy is 86%. 81 and 84 percent. And interesting, in this study they included about 75 women which were found to have ruptured membranes and 71 who didn't. And I think that's the most reliable study setup. So altogether it depends where you work and how um, the budget situation of your local health service. But I think all these tests have their value and especially if you're familiar with the Fernand test uh, and you know how what what um, the furning looks like under the microscope. It's not a bad, easy and quick test at all. Let's go back to stage one. Um, the uterine muscle activity, as is depicted here, um, is um, in response of, of the oxytocin production, uh, which comes from the posterior pituitary gland as you might remember from the first year of your study. By the way, oxytocin does not only work on the mu uterine muscles, but also works on the breast gland and is involved in the milk letdown reflex. Um, anyway, the cervical effacement, what do we mean by that? We can check whether that's taking place by vaginal digital examination and the cervix is losing its length, It means the thickness is changing so eventually the thickness of the cervix is equal to the thickness of the lower uterine segment. And usually in a primip that takes place at first before the cervix starts to dilate in a multiparous woman that sometimes those two phenomena, uh, effacement and dilatation, might go together. So a long cervix implies that not much has been taken into the lower uterine segment and vice versa. So long cervix means, after four hours of contractions, that most likely we are dealing with false labor. Here we see a diagram. This is a long and close cervix. The cervix, the cervical thickness, has been uh, reduced. And now here we see that the thickness of the cervix is equal to the lower uterine segment, and the cervix starts slowly opening up. And here we see further dilatation of the cervix. What is the normal duration of the first stage? An interesting question and I don't have a quick and short answer. I will look at some older and some recent fascinating publications which shed a light on this question. It varies widely but average some eight hours for primiparous women and four hours for multiparous women is a statement I found. When do we need to, clear, to declare that the duration is pathologically long and due to, for instance, inertia, insufficient, inadequate uterine activity or maternal exhaustion of other causes? What is acceptable? When is it okay to wait? And when should we interfere and offer our help? The classical work of Friedman, uh, published in 1954, uh, discriminates clearly in the first stage a latent phase and an active phase. And the latent phase is characterized by a slow progression, so the effacement and a slow progression of the dilatation of the cervix. And after this, Friedman postulated the cervic, cervical dilatation accelerates. And the, the difference between the act latent and active phase is roughly around three centimeters. And this was the system, this is what we believed, what we accepted until roughly 2010. Because in 2010, uh, Jim Zhang and his colleagues in the United States, uh, the so-called the Consortium on Safe Labor, they did uh, initially a retrospective study in a smaller group, but then in the same year they published a larger group of 60,000, more than 60,000 uh, singleton uh, pregnancies at term, which commenced with spontaneous on labor, resulted in a normal vaginal delivery and had a good neonatal outcome. And what were the findings of Zhang and his colleagues? 
the, here we see the cervical dilatations on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. And we find that a nilaparous woman, this is the curve of the nilaparous woman, and we see, yeah, initially a little bit slower dilatation and then some acceleration, but it's a very smooth curve. Here we see what happens if a lady had one child before, and this is a lady who had at least two vaginal deliveries uh, before. And interesting, the, the change over from latent and active is, according to this large study, closer to the 6 cm mark rather than the 3 cm mark. So, based on this solid evidence of Zhang and his colleagues, we should uh, say goodbye to Friedman's classical work and, I think, adopt to this more convincing evidence from the United States as well. Interesting as well, if we realize that more and more pregnant women are overweight or obese, there's a clear-cut association between the BMI, we see here the BMI of the liberous woman, and um, the BMI of more than 40 is the graph to the right, the yellow one. They, so BMI more than 40 has prolonged first stage compared to a BMI uh, 30 or 40 or even more than compared to the, the normal BMI or the overweight women. Same principles we can find when you look at um, the multiples women where there is a clear link between the BMI and the duration of the first stage. Well, it's good to realize there are differences, time differences, but labor is hardly ever a launch, a launch um, which some women hope that it will happen, that it happens in a few minutes. Uh, that's more exceptional than the rule. How should we manage the first stage of labor in the latent phase and the active phase? Supportive, non-negotiable, no difference. In the first latent phase, we should actually exert more patience. Time is important, no rush. Important to explain that to the woman and her family that the latent phase might take uh, sometimes even up to one day. In the active phase, however, it's important that we check the cervical progress. Um, you might even argue here every two hours rather than every four hours in the latent phase to check whether there's progress. And if there's a lack of progress, we have to ask ourselves what's going on. Is it the uterine activity? Is it the passenger, so the baby with a malposition or malrotation, etc.? Analgesia, yeah, we'll discuss that later. Important in both phases of the first stage. Fetal monitoring will uh, depend on the risk factors. The low risk women, we could uh, monitor the fetal heart rate by intermittent auscultation, especially, um, or continuous cardiotocogram if there's a high risk situation. And the same in the active phase. About the emotional support. Um, C to the power 3, the slogan of Daroga, I think it's about being a competent, confident, and last but not least, a caring uh, birth attendant, always, non-negotiable. It doesn't matter whether you feel grumpy or haven't slept all night, this is what our patients expect from us, and rightly so. Important what is going through the woman's mind. We should never assume, but explicitly explore that. For a nulliparous woman, there is usually fear for the birth process, for the great unknown. For the multiparous woman, she will be influenced by a past experience. A woman, or for all women and their family and friends and their entourage, they have heard stories, rumors, have um, served the web, they have perceptions and they have a personality. Some are more resilient, others are not. And they're all fine. I use this simple uh, two-arrow model. Find out how she feels. I think ideally a lady who is planning to deliver her baby should hover somewhere between quietly confident and at other times quietly scared. If you find out that she's overconfident on one hand or petrified on the other side of the spectrum, I think it's good to make sure 
that the overconfident lady realized that in general a delivery, a labor and delivery is not a walk in the park, but at least a, a strenuous run. And when she's pratified or anxious to explore that further, because both mindsets are not conducive to a spontaneous normal vaginal delivery. Let's realize uh, when you work in a hospital setting, there is a lot of technology around the woman. Cardiotogogram, fetal scalp electrode, IV drip, indwelling catheter, epidural, etc. There are different staff members, registrars, RMOs, consultants, midwives, students, nursing, uh, medical students, anesthetists, and so forth and so on. And these staff members nowadays usually work no more than eight hour shifts for very good reasons. Then we perform vaginal examinations. We insert a balloon catheter if we want to induce um, labor. We might want to take fetal blood sampling for pH or lactate and so forth and so on. All intrusive uh, in, uh, investigations, examinations and the privacy is very thin. Despite all our best efforts, by the way, who would not feel overwhelmed, intimidated and sometimes even disempowered by all, by the very technical clinical environment and staff. So continuous, genuine emotional support improves labor outcomes and as a pleasant side effect, our job satisfaction. Um, essential to use our emotional quotient. Always introduce yourself, close the door, sit down, make eye contact, hold hand if the woman is in fear. Acknowledge her feelings, her disappointment. Explain your assessment and the management you would like to suggest in a clear, concise and friendly manner. Offer verbal and non-verbal support by being there. Allow the woman to th think and discuss the proposed management with her loved ones. Give reassurance and positive feedback and encourage whenever possible. This mindset is paramount for a good outcome. Here is the evidence. The benefit of continuous and ideally one-to-one -one support. Four studies in young, low-income, perimperous women who gave birth on a busy labor ward in the absence of a companion in the United States. If that continuous support was present, the average duration of labor was shortened by 2.8 hours. More importantly, the normal vaginal delivery rate was doubled and the intervention rate of oxytocin use, forceps use and cesarean section rate were lowered significantly by a 58% margin 54% and respectively 46%. So a very important um, uh, 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 study which tells us that the human support is part of a good uh, strategy aiming for good outcomes. Last but not least, the, the women with labor support also reported higher satisfaction and better postpartum course. Then a few words about pain management. Where does the pain originate from? The uterine contractions result in visceral pain, which is enervated by thoracic uh, 10 to lumbar 1. The second stage, when the head is descending and the fetal head exerts pressure on the maternal pelvic floor, vagina and perineum, that's caused by somatic, that's somatic pain and that's transferred by the so-called Pudendal nerve, which is enervated by cervical nerves 2 till 4. Here we see a diagram. So, later, so in the first stage, this is where uterine pain comes from, this area, and this is when you later in uh, stage 2, the, the pain is more um, at the level of the cervical roots 2 to 4. Pain, of course, is subjective. And can vary. People have different pain thresholds. Uh, but sometimes the pain is perceived as heavy period pain to excruciating pain, uh, scored uh, on a scale of 10, uh, 10. Important cultural differences and you have to find out 
in some countries of the world, epidural is regarded um, a, a medical intervention and not necessary all, at all. And in Australia, for instance, um, epidural is almost default for ma many women. And that's okay too. Pain needs always to be taken seriously. It should never be ridiculed, verbal or non-verbal. Even when you would shrug your shoulders, the lady would uh, really be very frustrated with that. And rightly so. The trust is gone, or at least challenged, and unwillingly you contribute to worse outcomes. So, taking pain not seriously is a major source of avoidable dissatisfaction of women and their family and complaints which have to be managed by the hospital and ourselves. The, the analgesia in the first stage, as we discussed, the epidural, it can completely block the pain and that's wonderful. I think it's important to reduce the level of analgesia somewhat in the second stage to enable um, the woman to feel pressure on the pelvic floor which supports her in pushing naturally in a natural way. Oiports can be given either intramuscularly or subcutaneously. In the active phase of the first stage, um, laughing gas and to and to O gas can be given to top off the pain. And in the second stage, when we prepare for an instrumental delivery, a forceps or ventus, we can uh, provide the lady with a pedendal block. And in the second stage, if an episiotomy would be uh, necessary, or if we need to do suturing postnatally, a local perineal block um, can provide sufficient analgesia. So conclusion of the first stage. Labor is characterized by regular painful uterine contractions resulting in cervical changes, such as effacement and dilatation. The latent and active phase transition is not at 3, but at roughly 6 cm dilatation, as per studies in the United States published in 2010. The duration of the first stage varies considerably among and between parameters and multiples women, and there's a longer duration with increasing BMI. Conclusions regarding fast, false labor and ROM, rupture of membranes, recognize false labor, uh, an interval vaginal examination four hours duration shows there's no cervical uh, changes. Please explain this respectfully to the pregnant lady that labor has not yet commenced, which can be perceived as quite disappointing. Rupture of membranes at term is usually followed by spontaneous onset of labor within 24 hours and know the definition of PROM, P-PROM, uh, I forgot one P here, SROM and ARM. The diagnosis of rupture of membranes, pooling speculum, sterile speculum examination, try to demonstrate the crystallization under the light micros microscope, so-called ferning, or do a pH test, or a high vaginal swap for amniotic fluid protein, and there are two, uh, there are two or three different tests available. And I think it's important here that you consider your local situation. Uh, I would think take the accuracy of both of these tests in, in uh, consideration and the price. Then um, it's important to confirm that in a hospital environment, whether we want it or not, um, the environment provides additional uncertainties and can be perceived by many women as intimidating. How confident, anxious are pregnant women and is the pregnant woman and her family? Important to make that explicit and to assume nothing. Pain management is her prerogative, it's her choice, non-negotiable, full stop. And I think a cool head, which means evidence-informed and well-trained team and team leader and a warm heart, listening skills, genuine interest and passion for women and labor, and if possible, continuity of care, improve all the outcomes for mother and child, and satisfaction for all involved. This concludes the normal labor and delivery part one, the first stage.
uh, Zen master and chief Jimmy reckons that you should take a short walk, a short break, and continue with part two to get a complete picture of this fascinating labor and delivery process.